Hey everyone, welcome back to the Tea History Podcast. This is your host and narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, humble as ever, bringing you part 11 in the history of tea. We're past the point of no return, so if you made it this far, you might as well stay till the end. Since we started in part 1, we've looked at the history of tea from the most ancient and legendary times, beginning with Shandong, and how tea cultivation began in Yunnan and in the Ba and Shu states in Sichuan. Then it began to spread to other parts of China along the river systems after Qin Shi Huang united the country. Even in this earliest time, although tea still had a long way to go before it became the beverage we all know and love, the evolution was well underway. So we've looked at tea history from Shen Nong in 2737 BCE all the way up through the Ming Dynasty. We closed the last episode with the arrival of the Europeans. They began showing up in the late 16th century, and of course they too are going to be seduced by the pleasures of tea and will want it no less than the Tibetan, Central Asians, and, and everyone else who got a taste. Europeans started exploring faraway lands in the 15th century and into the 16th. People were traveling all over the place, and many with literary pretensions actually wrote quite a few nice travelogues. John Battista Ramusio wrote a book about his travels, and this one, written in Italian in 1559, just after the author's death, is probably the farthest back we can go with regard to when tea was first mentioned in the West. He was Venetian, so traveling was no big deal to him. He's remembered for his contribution to geography and for his book, Dele Navigazione e Viaggi, Voyages and Travels. Ramusio served in the Council of Ten in Venice, a.k.a. the Ten. So he was somebody, and he got to mix with a lot of interesting people who came from great distances. And Venice, being Venice, people from all over the known world came there to do business. Ramusio got to meet a Persian gentleman named Chagi Mehmet, better known as Haji Mohammed. His story was so interesting, Ramusio gave him a whole chapter in his book. And in this chapter, Ramusio recalls what this Persian, Haji Mohammed, said to him. Quote, He told me that all over Cathay, they made use of another plant, or rather of its leaves. This is called by those people, Chai Cathay, and grows in the district of Cathay, which is called Sichuan. This is commonly used and much esteemed all over those countries. They take of that herb, whether dry or fresh, and boil it well in water. One or two cups of this decoction, taken on an empty stomach, removes fever, headache, stomach ache, pain in the side, or in the joints, and it should be taken as hot as you can bear it. He said, besides, that it was good for no end of other ailments that he could not remember, but gout was one of them. And if it happens that one feels incommoded in the stomach for having eaten too much, one has but to take a little of this decoction, and in short time all will be digested. And it is so highly and esteemed that everyone going on a journey takes it with him. And those people would gladly give a sack of rhubarb for one ounce of chai katai. And those people of Cathay do say in our parts of the world, in Persia, and the country of the Franks, if people only knew of it, there is no doubt that the merchants would cease altogether to buy rhubarb. End quote. Because rhubarb is mentioned in the Shen Nong Ben Cao Jing, or Shen Nong's Herbal Root Classic, we know it was present in China for a long time, and they knew what to do with it. Rhubarb in its day, because of its laxative properties, was quite sought after as the ex-lax of its day. And going in the other direction, did you know that the kao and kaopectate comes from the word kaolinite, the very same stuff used to make porcelain in Jingda Jun? Anyways, after Jean-Baptiste Ramusio's mention, the next time tea makes an appearance in European literature was 29 years later, in 1588. Again, it was an Italian writing about tea in Japan. Quote, The beverage of the Japanese is a juice extracted from an herb called chia, which they boil to drink and which is extremely wholesome. It protects them from pituitary troubles, heaviness in the head, and ailments of the eyes. It makes them live long years, almost without languor. The Japanese have, as yet, no use for grapes. But they make a kind of wine from rice. But that which before all they delight to drink is water, almost boiling, mingled with the powdered cha. 
they are particular about having it well made. The most eminent sometimes make it with their own hands, taking the trouble to regulate the portions and to make the mixture for their friends. They even have certain rooms in their homes reserved for that alone. There is always at hand a kind of covered chafing dish from which they offer their friends a drink on arriving or taking leave. End quote. The topic of our CHP episode 98 was the Jesuit father Matteo Ricci. All of the Jesuits, when they first began to feel around the edges in China, encountered tea. They drank it and wrote about it. They probably were the first European drinkers of tea. The Portuguese were the first European seamen to ply the China coast. I'm not entirely sure what happened at the genesis of the Sino-Portuguese relationship, but the Chinese showed them the door right quick. But they were persistent, the Portuguese were. Their smugglers and pirates made enough of a nuisance of themselves on the east coast of China to influence the Chia Qing emperor to call for the leasing of a spit of land in southern Guangdong, and their main idea was to herd all these Portuguese into this ghetto, an enclave. And this, in 1557, became Macau. The Jesuits were formed in 1540, they sent Michel Ruggieri to Macau in 1579, and Matteo Ricci arrived in 1582. As soon as they started to make themselves at home in Macau, one of the Jesuit fathers, Gaspar de Cruz, wrote of T, quote, Whatsoever person or persons come to any man's house of quality, he hath accustomed to offer him a kind of drink called cha, which is somewhat bitter, red, and medicinal which they are wont to make with a certain concoction of herbs, end quote. You see, this was all down in the south, where they pronounced tea, cha. If the Portuguese Jesuit fathers had tried to establish their base in Fujian, they would have been calling it tea. In 1582, when Matteo Ricci first arrived in China, the Ming was already not looking too good and would be overrun by the Manchus in 62 years. It always starts like this. Someone from afar sees or hears something interesting in a new land, and from the prism of where they came from, they elucidate on this amazing thing for the people back home. Ricci said of tea in 1610 that the Chinese called this shrub cha, and that they, quote, gather the leaves in the shadow and keep it for daily decoction, using it at meals and as often as any guest comes to their house, yea, twice or thrice if he makes any tarrying. This beverage is always drunk or sipped hot, and on account of a particular mild bitterness, it is not disagreeable to the taste, but on the contrary, is positively wholesome for many ailments if used often, and there is not alone a single quality of excellence in the new leaf, for one surpasses the other, and thus you will often buy some at one gold eskew, or even two or three eskews a pound, if it is rated as the best." The most excellent is sold at ten and more, often at twelve gold eskews a pound in Japan, where its use is also somewhat different from that of China. For the Japanese, mix the leaves reduced to a powder in a cup of boiling water to the amount of two or three tablespoonfuls, and swallow this potion mixed in this manner. But the Chinese throw a few leaves in a pot of boiling water. Then, when it is tinctured with the strength and virtue of the same, they drink it quite hot and leave the leaves. End quote. Pretty much from the time Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope in 1497, for a century, all the way till 1596, the Portuguese had the whole Orient to themselves. Hey man, the early bird gets the worm. They were the earliest ones to arrive. So they were the ones who got to see tea up close first, purchase it, and take it back to the continent. There in Lisbon, Dutch traders would buy this novelty, tea, and take it back to where they came from. The Portuguese, eh, they didn't have any marketing savvy, I guess. Although they were the first Europeans to discover tea and bring it back to the continent from China, They didn't do too much to popularize it. We have the Dutch to thank for that. In 1595, though, the Dutch and the Portuguese had a trade spat, and Lisbon was closed to Dutch shipping. That's why the Dutch decided to do an end run around the Portuguese and sail to the Orient themselves. And they arrived in Indonesia in 1596 and set up a trade center in Bantam, in the western part of Java, west of Jakarta. 
And whilst in Asia, just like it was with everyone else, the Dutch people took to tea and knew a good thing when they tasted it. And these Nederlanders were the first to show their fellow Europeans the pleasures of this tasty new beverage. The Dutch proceeded to build, in 1619, a trade and distribution center in Batavia, which is in modern-day Jakarta. There, they traded in spices and used that place as a loading point for all goods traded in China, including tea. And if you thought traveling the ancient tea horse road from Ya'an and Sichuan to Lhasa and Tibet was long and treacherous, well, the voyage from the Spice Islands to Rotterdam was even more so. How to get that tea all the way to Northern Europe in large quantities without any of the spoilage and mold problems that faced tea merchants from the earliest days? Necessity is always the mother of invention. This is where black tea was finally figured out. And since black tea is fully 100% oxidized, there's no spoilage, no mold, no nothing. Problem solved. More on black tea later. So where was the origin for all of this earliest tea being shipped from China to Europe? If I told you from in and around the Wuyi Mountains in Fujian province, would you believe me? From this picturesque region of northern Fujian, the tea was transported quite a long distance to the port of Canton, 1,845 li in all, or 900 kilometers. Today, this is a 10-hour drive. Back then, it took weeks and weeks. You can imagine, along the route, all the duties and cumshaw that had to be taken care of from start to finish. Once the cargo arrived in Canton, the Dutch transshipped it to Bantam, where it was laden on board a vessel to Holland. And because they did business initially with Fujian traders, they used the Fujian pronunciation of tea rather than the Cantonese word cha. As I mentioned, the Dutch and the Portuguese were first to market. They got naming rights. That's why we in the West call it tea instead of cha. The Dutch were having the time of their lives in the South China Sea. The British were finding it difficult to compete with them. So on the last day of the year, 1600, the Queen granted a monopoly to a group of guys for all trade east of the Cape of Good Hope. And this, of course, became the Honorable East India Company. They, too, were determined to get into the tea business in a very big way. And boy, did they ever. Two years later, after the Dutch got wise to this, they set up the Dutch East India Company and established corporate bases in Indonesia. And somehow, they talked their way into Japan to trade directly with them. This was always a shaky deal, and before long, the Japanese will show them the door. The Dutch had it good in Japan for a while, even helping the Japanese kick the Portuguese out. The Portuguese had first landed on Japanese soil in 1543 on the island of Tanagashima, just south of Kagoshima in southernmost Kyushu. Francis Xavier and a few of his Jesuit brothers arrived in 1549. They'll enjoy a brief period in Japan until Toyotomo Hideyoshi kicks them and all foreigners out. Both the Portuguese and the Dutch saw the writing on the wall in Japan and knew where they weren't welcome, so they started looking in the direction of China. 1610 was a banner year in the history of tea in the West. That's when the first shipment of Chinese tea arrived at The Hague. It was green tea, not the black tea that would soon afterwards become the standard. When black tea starts shipping, and after Marguerite de la Sablière in France becomes the first person to add milk to tea, this will later be a good thing for the Dutch dairy industry, because the Dutch seized on this manner of drinking tea almost at once. And for the remainder of the 17th century, one after another, the countries of Europe came face to face with Camellia sinensis. By 1635, tea, or <clears throat> the China drink, as it was known in its European infancy, had already established itself in the Dutch royal court. I read that by 1680, already, every home in the Netherlands had a room specially reserved for tea, and if they couldn't afford that, at least they had a tea service. The Dutch initially purchased a green tea called Baihao, which in the local Fujian dialect was pronounced Bakho. I mean, I don't, I don't actually speak any of the mean dialects, but eh, it's close to that. 
The Dutch, well, like most foreigners, couldn't get their mouths around any of these Chinese pronunciations, so they called it Pico. And as a marketing ploy, and as a respectful nod to their ruling House of Orange, they marketed the tea as Orange Pico. And all these years, the name stuck. Lipton always mentions on their package that their product is Orange Pico and Pico Cut Black Tea. The Dutch didn't go to China to obtain the tea. Initially, it was brought to their base in Indonesia by Chinese traders. And Dutch vessels then transported the tea back to Europe from there. Tea is going to permeate these European nations in the exact same way it did in China. It started with polite society first, with the royals and aristocrats. They got to enjoy tea first. And this court patronage would trickle down to others in Dutch society who lived on the fringes of royalty and aristocracy. And as it made its way down to the masses, Dutch values and culture blended with the pleasures of drinking tea. And what happened in the Netherlands was the same thing that happened everywhere else in the world. A tea culture, particular to those people, was born. And it's still going strong after more than 400 years. Between 1610 to 1640, the earliest decades of tea drinking in the Netherlands, it remained somewhat of a novelty drink, but as the decades of the 17th century passed, it soon became all the rage in Dutch society. And where there's a demand, there are always going to be merchants willing to risk life and limb to supply that demand. By 1675, the Dutch market had been supplied sufficiently enough so that Anyone in any major city in the Netherlands could walk to their corner grocer and buy a tin of tea. Europeans started with China green tea. Black tea, or Hongcha as it's called in Chinese, red tea, began its history in the early Ming Dynasty in Wu Yishan, again, northern Fujian province. When the Hongwu Emperor pulled the rug out from under them, demanding tribute teas be packaged in loose-leaf form instead of in its compressed form, the producers in Wuyi Mountain needed to find something new to replace their top-of-the-line green tea cakes that had been prized and in demand for so long. I mentioned because of their value, these tea cakes had a secondary use as a unit of currency. Now, in one fell swoop, After the Hongwu Emperor's edict regarding loose tea, tea cakes were no longer requested nor considered fashionable. Because tea in its compressed tea cake form was readily used as a kind of money, it presented complications to the Chinese state as these tea cakes contributed mightily to corruption in the government-managed tea industry. So rampant had the corruption become, some say this was one of the primary reasons why Zhu Yuanzhang the Hongwu Emperor, why he said, no more cake tea. His anti-corruption measures at the outset of his reign took the word draconian to a new level. How they actually chanced upon the way to make black tea is, (laughs) of course, the stuff of legends. Tea artisans figured out that after withering and rolling the leaves and bruising them to step up the cellular oxidation, working them with your hands or feet, the process forced the juices of the tea leaf to be brought to the fore, whereupon the oxygen in the air mixed with these tea juices, crushed out of the cells of the leaf. And it did that thing it does, and the leaves started turning black along the edges. And then before long, if you did nothing to halt the oxidation process, the whole leaf was turned completely black. Then the leaves would be fired to stop the process, and what you had was black tea. When the foreigners began poking their nose around this part of China, they really took to black tea at once. The Chinese are going to be rather astounded at this because in their way of thinking, this fully oxidized black color leaf was something so inferior to the kind of green teas they liked. Using the banana comparison to the Chinese, they couldn't figure out why these foreigners preferred rotten bananas, all black on the outside to fresh yellow bananas. Nonetheless, it was green tea that was the first tea to be exported out of China to the West. This was probably Songlo tea, or as it's known in the history books, Songlo tea. This place was located in Xioning County in Anhui, adjacent to Huangshan, and just to the east of Jingdezhen. Songlo tea is going to join Bohe, 
Congo, Pico, and Hyson as one of the other great historic teas that the West imported in great quantities. The good people of Song Luoshan will tell you this is where the first pan-fried green tea was produced in China. Remember, to pan-fry the leaves was called chao ching. Green tea had been produced in Song Luoshan since the early Ming and achieved initial fame for its supposed medicinal qualities. This area will be important later on in the series when we introduce Mr. Robert Fortune. He will take a grand tour of Songlo Mountain and learn all about the secrets of green tea production there. We'll get to this in good time. What a story. One of the legends as far as how black tea came to be grown in the Wuyi Mountain area went like this. The villagers had just picked their crop of tea and were in the beginning stages of processing it. Then word reached them that some army was about to pass through their neck of the woods. That was always a cause for worry, because you never knew if the passing army would wreck the town or not. It was always a possibility that a passing army might ransack a village looking for food or supplies. In this case, the soldiers decided to stay for about a week, and the Chanong, the tea farmers, dared not make any moves while the soldiers were in their village. All the fresh tea they had just picked was hurriedly hidden under covers or tarps of some sort. And the soldiers, they bivouacked in the village and, seeing these soft, covered mounds of vegetation, figured, oh, this would be a perfect place to flop. So all these many covered piles of freshly picked tea leaves ended up being used as beds. And after a week from all the heat generated by these soldiers and All their tossing and turning at night had agitated and twisted the leaves sufficient enough to cause quite a bit of oxidation. After about a week, the soldiers picked up and vacated the town. The farmers quickly tried to salvage whatever they could, but in the end, looking at all these withered, blackened tea leaves, eh, they considered this a lost cause. But some enterprising person there suggested they rush this stuff to market anyway and see if anything at all could be salvaged from this disaster. Then, as the story goes, there were some foreign merchants, I don't know where they came from, but they saw the black tea, purchased the whole lot, and paid the farmer in advance for next year's crop as well. And a new tea was born. And it was called Bohe. And Bohe tea is going to act as the benchmark for the rest of the tea trade with China. Now, I myself don't speak any of the mean bait dialects, as I said, but Bohi is a foreign bastardization of their way of saying Wu Yi. So Bohi it became, and for a long time, this was the only place in China where foreigners could get their hands on black tea. Later on, even though a tea didn't come from the Wu Yi mountain area, it would still be called Bohi. It sort of became eh, the Kleenex of black tea. This was the kind of tea Thomas Jefferson and many of the American founding fathers drank and was among the varieties of tea dumped into Boston Harbor in 1773. Other black teas will be discovered later on and will also be exported in massive quantities, most notably Kimun tea, or Qimun cha, which also originated in Anhui province. This will make a big splash when it hits the market in the 1870s. The other one was called Kongu. That was considered the premium black tea. Kongu was the name in the local dialect for the word Kung Fu, as in Kung Fu Cha, which we discussed uh, in a previous episode. It was called that because more processing steps were required to work the leaf than with Bohi. Also, Kongu use the larger tea leaves farther down from the bud. Well, if no one has any violent objections, I'm going to do a hard stop right here, and we'll review what I just mentioned, and then continue this discussion with the green tea of the day, which the European traders called Hyson. All for next time. So, until that day, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from L.A. So glad you made it this far. You may as well come back next time for what might very well be another delectable episode of the Tea History Podcast. <laughs>